Uh, the animal rights movement is uh, arguably the most altruistic uh, movement, movement which doesn't really compare with any other um, social justice movement. There are many, many similarities between the two, but, uh, uh, but, but not really a, a movement seeks to gain privilege, a uh, social movement, justice, seeks to uh, gain privileges for a precise group, group of people, uh, like the civil rights movement or the gay rights movement or the feminist movement. Uh, they want to be included in the society. The same, um, in a sense, oppressed people want to be accepted as equal, as equals into, the, into society, while the movement to free animals must fight for exclusion. Oppressed animals don't want to be part of a the society. They want to cease to be used. They want to. Uh, they want them to uh, to cease to exist, to be born, to exist, for use. Um, so we face we face uh, greater challenges working to free animals. We face uh, so much economic uh, pressure against our movement, and we overall overall have little support. So sometimes it's uh, it's hard to get our act together. Throughout the, the years I've been involved in, in uh, animal rights movement, I've been through uh, different phases and cycles, and I'm sure I keep changing. Um, my own personal story follows follows a pattern that I'm certain many of you can have experienced. <laughs> In my first phase, for instance, I was highly motivated to educate the poor meat eater or the non-vegan who doesn't get it. This, is what, this was a phase where <clears throat> I was open to uh, most ideas and uh, which where the motto could have been do anything but do something and where the punchline would have been, go vegan. Uh, I'd be present at pretty much any event, and I wouldn't understand why, why people would stay home instead of coming out. Um, this was a, a phase also where I would get highly influenced by others, and I was busy forming my own opinions. This is an incidentally the period where I arrived in Toronto with my husband. It was in 2008. Both of us were uh, brand new, clumsy vegans, and uh, I had a sense that there was more to do to help animals than going vegan and buy uh, cruelty-free products. So that's why I started to look for opportunities to get involved. And it was not hard because Toronto is pretty active. In with regards to animal rights, so uh, it was not long before I attended my first uh, fur protest, which was quite exciting, I thought. Uh, yeah, I thought it was pretty neat and very empowering to, uh, to attend those. You know, with a poster, uh, fur is murder, I, I was convinced that I could change people's minds. But looking back now, I realize that I might have lacked judgment at times. I wouldn't be too shy to get into meat eaters' face and uh, dump on them lots of information that they didn't necessarily want to hear. But uh, I, was, I was so eager to convey the message, the urgency of the message that torturing, killing, and consuming animal, animals had to be stopped. Um, but it's also during this period <clears throat> that productive actions were hosted with various activists, uh, namely, Ian, you might remember, um, this, uh, this pretty big um, protest against during the, there was a big protest during the vivisection uh, conference. Oh, yes. That was, uh, <laughs> that was, that was good. And there was also uh, different uh, eye-catching demos that I, uh, uh, I worked with other people. So these are good memories as far as I'm concerned. However, it didn't, 
didn't last because over time another phase materialized where uh, frustration grew. Frustration grew. Uh, because what you see, you hear, or experience is, um, becomes more acute. Everywhere we turn in society, we are reminded constantly that uh, yeah, we live in a violent and cruel society. <clears throat> so in this phase, the suffering of animals is absolutely overwhelming. Each image and video you, uh, you try to, to watch grows uh, harder to look at. Basically, you don't get used to animal suffering. You really don't. When you see or smell meat, eggs, or milk, you, um, you don't only think of the murder of the animal. You think you can see the process, all the process that leads to the murder. And when you see a brand uh, like Clorox or CoverGirl, you don't, you don't see, you, you see more than the brand. You see, you can visualize the animals being tested on. And the same goes for a fur trim. Each one, e each and every fur trim is a catastrophe in itself. And uh, it, is a, it is a catastrophic trend that has exploded over the last five years. So I started to feel that uh, it's not going to get any better and there's nothing to be done to change animal suffering. I also started to question the assumption that educating the public about what happened to, happens to animals uh, could, could not necessarily motivate anyone to change their consum consumption habits. I would think, well, there, there is something, something doesn't work. It's maybe it's, it's because uh, there's something wrong with the, the way we convey the message. Maybe we have to spare the meat eater, you know, because, um, and besides, you don't want the meat eater to, to hate vegans and activists. So I think uh, often we consider ourselves as being outside of the, so the society. We consider ourselves as the outsiders, I think. And, um, and uh, as such, we, uh, sometimes I, I feel like we try to spare the non-vegans and uh, we don't want to shock him too much. We don't want, uh, we don't want to, uh, to hammer him with violent arguments in favor of veganism. And, uh, but there's, there's also a, another factor that I realized could be quite debilitating uh, in the movement, which is uh, being let down by other activists. When people around you burn out or don't show up, I think it has an effect on you. After being around for a while, I could see that people come and go in the movement uh, all the time. Uh, you know, people you start to like working with fade away or disappear, and uh, this, is, this is disappointing. So this is a good reminder for all of us that when uh, that our actions can have an effect on others. So after that, um, maybe after three years or something like that, uh, I started to uh, to go through a period where I was hurt and angry most of the time. I was uh, hurt and angry on behalf of animals, of course, not on behalf of myself. Especially the day a friend showed up flashing her um, new fur trimmed coat. I think it was cat work, dog fur, I'm pretty sure of that. And this person knew about what was going on in the fur industry. She knew and yet she chose to buy this horror. So the public resistance at that point hit hard. And it's even harder when it, uh, when it comes from people close to you. So really, um, the poster for his murder didn't work anymore for me. For me, it was ineffective. But um, yeah, I, know I, I didn't want to engage with non-vegans, and I felt it was a waste of time to educate the public. I thought, well, 
most know about, or they have a good idea of uh, what's, what's implied in, uh, in their food and their, the items they buy, and yet they choose to, to they don't change, they, they choose to buy that stuff. The endless public uh, resistance to our message is, um, can be a great source of distress. <clears throat> when I went through this period of anger and feeling of uh, hopelessness, helplessness, and even cynicism, um, I had to take some time, some time off, basically. I had to, to think for myself, I had to wonder, okay, is there another direction I can go? And uh, incidentally, that's funny because it's during that period that I started to, uh, to be a caretaker for a feral cat colony. And this was part of my rehabilitation, probably because you, uh, you help directly. You know who you're helping, you know where your actions go, and uh, to me this is the most meaningful type of activism. I guess Brent back to talk about that later, I don't know. But uh, yeah, so anyways, after a, a, about a year, oh, over a year ago I would say, I guess uh, what gave me new hope was discovering the meat abolition movement. Um, the hardest thing for me is to come to the re realization that I can only stand um, I can only stand beside my, my brothers and sisters, the animals, and I cannot do anything. You see trucks, you know, go by, truckloads of, of uh, animals go by, uh, you see uh, animals in pet shops and so on and so on. You cannot do anything because remember, it is illegal to prevent torture and murder currently. And uh, after reading about the, the meat abolition movement, I came to the conclusion that uh, without changes in law, humans will never make peace with animals. The world will never go vegan unless it, is, it becomes illegal to torture and murder our, uh, animals. Because it's uh, essentially not in human's nature nor in the society's nature to voluntarily give up exploiting animals. I might cut a little because I find I have too much stuff here. You have about five minutes. Okay, well basically the, this movement ignited my interest because it finally treats the problem of animal um, exploitation as a, as, as a social justice issue and not as a individual uh, choice to go vegan. So um, abolishing the consumption of meat and all other uses of animals by law, as, as I see it now, right now, is the only way to uh, rescue individuals from humans, human tyranny. This is uh, essentially where I stand today and uh, we'll see how it, we'll see how it, uh, where it takes me. Um, also, the project, uh, the March to Close Our Slaughterhouses, um, is a way to engage hundreds of people. And um, the, way, the way people can take ownership in such an event is, uh, is really powerful and it makes, it makes a goal more, more tangible, I find. So by finding a niche or a project or an area that we are passionate about, we can avoid downs, down periods, and uh, even burnout that threatens all of us in this movement. All the things that I've talked about, the fact that people come and go at a fast pace, the endless animal suffering, the massive public resistance to our message, and um, being let down by other activists can lead to despair and exhaustion. We start full of energy. We, um, we picture huge crowds of protesters at every single demo and protest. We think that reason and compassion will win over injustice. But at some point, uh, the reality sinks in and um, and uh, we can feel that our efforts are absolutely useless. We can feel that, I'm not saying it is, we can feel that. But by focusing our energy and talents 
to something that we are comfortable with and we find meaningful, we can avoid being, we can avoid being overwhelmed and becoming weary. The reality is that even if I could work full time to achieve animal liberation, uh, there would be no guarantee of success. All we know, um, we all know that our, how great are the challenges and obstacles in our way. But as uh, someone said, don't worry about being su successful, just be faithful. And I think this applies wonderfully well to animal rights activism. No matter how hard we work, there is no guarantee of success. But if we are faithful, we cannot fail, right? And uh, also, we have to realize that um, we have to realize that working for for less violent society, to work to, to to build a less violent society, to work for peace and justice, is really a long time commitment. That's it. Brenda Brofman. Um, I'm the founder of the Wishing Well Sanctuary, which is just north of Toronto, for some of you who don't know. Hopefully you will all at one point come and visit, visit our animal family. Um, I um, just give a little background on myself. Uh, I've always been sort of what I consider to, to be a lover of animals. Um, uh, very sensitive and, um, you know, I used to even collect rocks that I thought were that looked a bit lonely or something. It just spoke to me. But I've always felt a little bit like I've connected with, I believe in the fact that we're all connected, that somehow between people and animals and the environment, there is energy among all of us and that we are connected. What we do to ourselves, what we do to each other and, and to the land is going to impact all of us. Um, as I became more aware of, of uh, the issues and uh, just seeing the, the animals in the trucks and how painful and just it's, it's it was devastating I would cry every time I saw one of the transport trucks um, and it, I find and I, I still sometimes find it can be very overwhelming just the numbers are just so vast it's difficult to get for me anyway for me to get my mind around you know, billions per annum. Uh, at the sanctuary, we have 51 animals. Well, it's fantastic for those 51 animals. It's wonderful for us, of course, and for all, all the, the children and the adults that come to visit. But it's, you know, an infinitesimal drop in the bucket compared to, to really the animals that need help. And I'm, I'm keenly aware of that. Uh, you know, even if we were double the size and had triple the funds, um, uh, you know, so we have 100 or 200 animals, it's still really nothing. And so um, that's why I strongly believe in the fact of education. And so part of our mandate at the sanctuary is to, is to have humane education. We want to grow more and more of those programs. Because like it or not, we really need people. It's people that are going to affect the change. And uh, while it's tempting, I know that uh, there are many times in the past I have felt so ashamed of being human and I have apologized to animals on behalf of the human species. Um, I, I think it's important, there's a few things that are important. One is to remember that there are people like us and more out there and to focus not only on what we can't do and who is, who is not responding, but to the, the like-minded, like-spirited people uh, that we need. We need community, that's clear. Uh, I know that over times when I have felt either overwhelmed, I have struggled with depression and anxiety from time to time over the course of my life, um, that I would tend to isolate, and which of course is the worst thing in the world to do. Uh, it's, we need each other. And um, the My, my depression um, had led me really to think about what could I do, 
when I'm, because it's not constant, obviously, but it's a little bit of a current that's always threatening to, to come. And, and um, what can I do that is meaningful to me, that what I feel passionately about, which of course is animal protection, I also happen to really love kids and I believe strongly in education. And what, I've been to the abattoirs, I've, I've read a lot, I've, I've seen a lot of videos, um, you know, each one more painful than the next. And, um, and thank God there are many of you who are doing what you do and are standing and bearing witness and, and looking at and seeing the eyes of these magnificent souls that, you know, have, I, I was writing some notes and I thought, you know, they have no voice and they have no choice. And I, I've wondered over the course of my life, you know, why do I feel so strongly about animals? What is it? I mean, of course, I mean, it's, it, there's a lot of good reasons to do so, but I wondered, you know, how much of is it, is it that it, certain things resonate within me and then perhaps also within others? So, you know, do I, do I recognize in their eyes feelings of, of helplessness, that they don't have a choice in life, that they are being, you know, whether, whether it's an animal that's being transported to the slaughterhouse or, you know, a rabbit whose eyes are, you know, animals that are being used for cosmetic and product testing, and any of the animals, they, they don't have a choice. And I recognize that feeling from somewhere deep within. I don't know if it's from my childhood, I don't know if it's from a past life, but there's something about that that I, I, I can feel it. And, um, and so it, it reaffirms my strong desire to make a difference. Uh, I've always wanted to make a difference. I grew up uh, with uh, relative wealth, I mean, all of us do being in Canada, uh, as compared to other parts of the world. But I, I knew very early on that I was really blessed and lucky and a lot of people weren't so fortunate. And so it became important to me at an early age to want to make a difference, to make a, uh, you know, make a positive difference in this world. And um, I, uh, I, I recognize that what I'm doing at the sanctuary, and I say I just because I founded it, but it's a whole team effort uh, to, you know, to make it go and make it grow and, and make it what it is, um, that um, we all need a multi-pronged approach for, for such a vast problem. And as, as you said, it's a, you know, it's a social justice issue, and it's so enormous that we need, I think, everybody. So while I, I can think, oh my God, what am I doing? It's just, you know, I have this little property with a few animals and we're educating a few kids. Um, there's just so much more to be done. And really, as we're sitting here right now, animals are suffering. You know, every second, like every moment, it doesn't stop. And, and then I, you know, it's easy to go into a vortex of, oh God, this is horrible. And I can feel my energy just get sucked down. And I remember at those times that I've, been, I've worked hard at um, thinking about how what I want is to raise the energy. I want to be a part of raising, having a higher energy and, and adding to the, to the universe, not depleting it. And so my own feelings of, of horror and, and overwhelm and pain uh, really deplete and, and are counterintuitive to what I'm hoping to achieve. So um, that actually does help, as, long, you know, as well as thinking about sending out prayers and, and light around those trucks or, or anywhere. I mean, we can't see every animal that's suffering, but we know they are out there. and We've seen pictures of them. And, and to say, you know, maybe this is at least the end of the horrible suffering that you've endured since the time you were born. God, you know, God bless you, and hopefully next time around, you know, it'll be better. Um, and I'm sorry. I mean, I, I, we can't, we can't do something for everyone at all times, clearly. Or, you know, here we are talking about burnout. Um, uh, it, it, I guess everyone has a different, um, a, a different chemistry, a different way of, of living, a different way of thinking. And um, some people are more resilient than others, naturally. I think that we can learn resilience and we can learn tools to become more resilient, but but it's, I think most of us, the people that certainly that I've met that are interested in animal protection and, um, and, and feel very strongly about these issues, um, are sensitive and maybe, um, 
aren't able to sort of let things roll off. We're not, we don't let things roll off our backs. We, we actually absorb stuff and really feel it strongly and passionately, which on the positive end can, can make for a very powerful movement. Uh, the downside, of course, is that we, you know, crash and burn, and then, of course, you know, we're no good to anybody, we're not accomplishing anything. So, um, I think that, um, <clears throat> what do I think? I think that, uh, I'm thrilled, I mean, the timing of this, this evening was, was very interesting. I did want it before I forget, uh, the Wishing Well Sanctuary is hosting a workshop, actually, on this very topic. We're bringing in a facilitator to, to, uh, to deal, it's called uh, the cost of, of caring, uh, compassion fatigue, and that's on May 3rd, uh, and it's going to be a full day, experiential, she'll be giving us tools, and um, uh, we'll get into groups, I guess, and, and no one will have to say anything if they don't want to, of course, but I think um, uh, a lot of people have come up to the sanctuary and have said, oh God, I just needed to be at a sanctuary where we can see healthy and happy animals in a lovely environment, because it's so painful to constantly see the suffering and the horror that we endure. And, um, and that's why I thought, oh great, you know, that I think I, part of the, our mandate at the sanctuary is to help inform and to, to, to help people heal and, um, in, in any number of ways. And we, as I said, we need each other and we need, I think, um, a kind of a constant infusion of, of, um, of, of good energy, of tools, of, of caring and compassion among each other. I know that sometimes there are issues among, like any group, people are people are people, and of course some people have different views about things, you know, whether it's welfare versus rights, whether it's, you know, there's this way to do that, or there's that way, and my way is right and yours isn't. Um, I think that that's really counterproductive. I think that can be very painful for people, um, and, and there's a continuum. I mean, I don't know about the rest of you, but I was used to be a big meat eater. Um, you know, it was a continuum. I, as I became more aware of the issues, as I learned about animals raised for food, uh, yeah, I became horrified. And naturally, I stopped eating, and, and the more I learned, the more my own behaviors and my own choices changed. And um, I think for all of us, that that is empowering. That we're living in our integrity. I mean, I certainly couldn't look at, you know, Alistair, who's one of our steer, or, you know, or any of the animals, look at them in their eyes and give them a hug if I was eating their brethren, you know, like I just couldn't, obviously. And um, I think it, and it feels good to know that our, our actions are aligned with, with our deep beliefs and our philosophy of, of life and living. We cannot control other people, much as we would like to. Um, it's hard enough controlling ourselves, I think, sometimes. So, but what we can do is, is look at our own lives and one step at a time. I mean, it's, I constantly have to tell myself it's not, I can't think about billions and, and feel, and right now, again, I mean, how many animals have died since I last said right now and right now, you know, or are suffering or left out or being beaten or abused or anything? Um, it's, I can't do something about all of that. I wish, I wish, I wish I could. Um, so what I need to do, and I think that, you know, in sharing with people, we say, what, what can we do? And focus on, okay, this is what I can do. This is my little piece of what I can do um, to make a difference, hopefully, and have that grow over time. Um, and as I learn more, and as I meet more people, and as we band together, you know, more and more, I think we will become more and more effective. Um, it, it, it can feel like we're, never, we're not going to get anywhere. I think people don't like change including us, not just mediators who don't like to change. There's a lot of, uh, you know, it's hard to change, and it's hard to look deep into our own eyes, look into the mirror, and say, gee, you know, I'm not sure I really like what I see. Uh, we don't want to. Um, but I, I, I do think that when we are, when we get up in the morning and know that we are, whatever little bit we can do, it's one little bit more than was done before we attempted that, before we did it. And... It, it, none of us are acting alone. So I just I want to you know, reaffirm that I, mean, I feel honored and thrilled. I've met so many wonderful people since uh, founding the sanctuary, and it has really enriched my life. And I hope that that will enable me, better enable me, to do even more. Uh, because I believe that as we feel stronger inside, we're more capable, of course, of, of doing more. So uh, 
So, I, and so oh, I'm sorry, I was thinking about the topic and, you know, what do we do to cope with some of those things? I mean, I, I, I do meditation, sometimes more successfully than others. My mind has a tendency to, to whir and twirl and, and do all kinds of calisthenics. Um, you know, go for walks, um, play with my dogs, play with the sheep, the cat, you know, play, just just connect with with another soul that that uh, that I can feel, I feel love for and from. And um, I mean, I've tried the other routes, you know, whether it was drugs or alcohol, um, eating, you know, just not paying attention, whatever, numbing out in one way or another. And none of those ways uh, really are very effective. I mean, they work in the moment, in the short term, but, but as, a, as an activist and as somebody who wants to make a difference in the world, uh, we gotta be sharp. We wanna be on the ball. We need to, we need to know what's going on. And uh, as painful as it is, um, we can feel good about the fact that, that we are confronting this. And again, you know, we're doing it not necessarily literally holding hands, but metaphorically, figuratively holding hands. That makes all the world of difference to me, and um, yeah. So I thank you all for being here, and uh, that's kind of my bit. <laughs> so I wanted to focus on things you can do to avoid or bypass burnout. Um, in my own experience, I was uh, more depressed before Big Safe started, and. Uh, before doing the, um, the monthly weekly vigils. And so I've been doing three vigils per week since July 2011, so that's two and a half years. So I've witnessed a lot, but uh, I am not. I am less depressed than I was before. In fact, I feel more empowered and I see changes happening. So I, I just wanted to sort of present the, the, this, this other side about um, the problem of under-witnessing rather than over-witnessing. In fact, I feel bad not being there when the trucks are going by, sometimes I walk my dog, um, when there isn't a vigil and I see trucks going by and I run up and I just try to witness by myself um, and I feel sad that those trucks are going by and there's no witnesses um, that care, they're extending care and love. Um, so first of all I wanted to ask you what does it feel like to be burnt out and what, what are its sources? So just some of the feelings, just give me some examples of feelings that you feel that you think are associated with burnout. Sadness. Okay. Business. Helplessness, sadness, exhaustion, 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 overwhelming, overwhelming of not being able to do more. So, like ineffectiveness or not? Yes, ineffectiveness. Thank you. Anything else? Caring oh. less. Caring less. Starting to care less. Yeah. Helplessness. Okay. A lot of fear. Fear. Just uh, the implications of what's happening and like you're for the animals. Um, okay, Any anyone else? Anger, a lot of anger in the rest of the world. Rage. Okay, rage. <laughs> okay, anything else? So, in action, like you stop doing what it is you actually want to do. Right. And then you feel guilty because you're not doing it. Right. Okay, that's you're too. tired, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Okay, uh, some other ones I came up with. Uh, um, I guess you said scared, worried. I don't know if you said depressed, tired, fed up, judgmental, hateful, violent. Um, so what do you think some of the sources are? I, I know it's a complex question, but just some examples of what you think are the reasons for feeling burnt out. Helplessness. Helplessness. Not seeing change fast enough. Yeah. 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 And also feeling like I'm not, and also like feeling angry at myself for not being able to do more and like just just, just thinking that, like, I, like if I actually like wanted to do something meaningful, like I should be opening the trucks and letting the animals go, and just feeling kind of angry at myself for not doing that or refusing to do that. So being infected, not doing enough at, at the moment. So there's some justice in front of you, not doing enough. Okay, so feeling alone, which is an internal thing, and you can talk about some external factors like being ineffective. I think other uh, internal ones that the source is within you and that you can control is uh, arguing with others and then also arguing amongst ourselves, sort of infighting. So you actually have a lot of power to control some things. Um, and then the next question I have for you guys is uh, what is the opposite 
of uh, getting burnt out, and how can you feel empowered instead? What was the second part? And, and how can you feel empowered instead? Showing your love for the animals by showing your love to others. Okay, so the opposite of feeling burnt out is when you're actually showing love to animals. You're going the positive route. Right. Anyone else? Connecting with others who feel the same, or other activists. So community, like Carolyn said earlier, community is a big factor. Going to the vigils, and even though as sad as they are, is still empowering because we are as a group together, and that's very empowering to me at least. Doing the same actions, but changing what, how meaningful the outcome is. So if you do the action of being at the vigil and you're burnt out because you think you can't help the pigs, maybe that's the wrong outcome you had in the first place because you never could have. But if the outcome is, did I have an effect on another human being? Did I somehow even change one other person? Then that can be very meaningful and inspiring. Okay. There's so many levels of effectiveness, different ways to think of it. Yeah. Okay, so, so feelings are like you're actually helping others, whether it's the animals, offering comfort, offering them water, melon, uh, um, helping other activists. Uh, some people, I mean, we're talking about this, Michael, yesterday, I guess, uh, about how some activists go to vigils to help other activists build community. I mean, I was so impressed when Pia, Pia's not here, Pia Stein said to me, one of the biggest reasons she goes to vigils is just to support other activists. I just thought that was very impressive. And Michael does that too, he sort of he carpools activists from all over. Um, so it's building community. Um, the feeling of being empowered is something that's not associated with the uh, with uh, burnt up, or it's sort of the opposite, you know. Um, and as you mentioned, being part of the community. And so what do you think are the sources of these feelings of the op being of these feelings of being empowered and being effective as opposed to Burnout. Burn so, what do you think are some of the sources? I think having a project, like uh, something that has a beginning, middle, and end, and just focus on it with it. That's interesting. Achievable goals. Anyone else? In my own little world on Facebook, I have noticed that there are people that are um, responding in their own way by posting. Um, proactive or animal issues that it never in the whole time I've been friends with them have ever shown that before. So I know that my little seeds are planted and they are growing slowly, but it is, so that's my way of dealing with it too, that I don't discontinue, I continue that because I know I see the effect. That's somewhat of a conclusion for me. So you're planting seeds and, and they're growing, yeah. Okay. Anyone, anyone else? I think it's the important to increments. Like, if you just, just look at the importance of being achieving something, this larger goal, then it's very frustrating. But if you recognize that those increments, whether it's somebody, or, or what I call the gateway animal issues, like dolphins, I consider that, I work in the addictions, so it's not gateway, but dolphins are a gateway you know, to something else. And that's valid. That's <coughs> okay, so thanks a lot. I'll just, uh, so I'll, I'll talk about some of the sources, and my talk today is informed by by Tolstoy mainly, so I'll draw a lot on him. Um, so with respect to sources, uh, doing what is right in the present, so every moment, so that, that's something that's very empowering. And um, a couple of people mentioned here the frustration, I think uh, Carolyn and others, that you know, you're not freeing the animals. And if we feel pain and burnout, it's partly because of that, because we're not doing what's right. If you were in the truck, and, and full of other people in the truck, and there were people bearing witness, they go, go have some water, um, you know, and saying, oh, we love you, I'm sorry, and you're, you're about to go to the death camp, I mean, it's not very impressive, and you, you demand a much more, and you have every right to demand to be completely free. So th it's pretty lame, to tell you the truth, and I certainly felt that at the Golden Pig State Vigil this week. I was thinking, oh, because there it's more immediate, the slaughterhouse is right there, and you can hear the screaming, uh, and it's, it's, uh, it felt pretty lame, uh, but, and plus there's no public there to, to offset that feeling where you're actually giving leaflets and converting people. So there is this uh, problem, and, and it has to do with a philosophical issue or approach. One is called deontological, which is you do what's right in the present every single moment of your life. You're like Jesus, you're like Buddha, you're like Tolstoy, you're like Gandhi, um, whatever the consequences. If you're dragged away to jail for that, fine. If you're you know, uh, you know, 
nailed to the cross, fine. You know, you're a martyr, you're not a, you're not a tyrant, and you're not a bystander. You do what's right every second. Um, the, what we're doing is called the utilitarian approach, and there's a lot of problems with this kind of philosophical approach because you, you assume that you're so smart that you can figure out what the uh, what the consequences are. So you're saying, I'm doing this, I want to go to jail now, I'm doing this because there's a greater good associated with it, but how do you know that? Sometimes you're more effective by being a Jesus or a Buddha or just doing what's right in the present all the time. If we all did that, maybe social change would happen faster. Yes, there would be some martyrs, but maybe people would see this is absolutely wrong and we should just be giving water or saying I'm sorry as, as a death threat is going to a slaughterhouse. So that, that just should, uh, I'm just giving you some of the, the, these paradoxes and you know, uh, inconsistencies. But, um, so doing what is right, when you do that, there is absolutely empowerment even if you're a martyr, even if you sacrifice and suffer for it. And so, um, and that's an internal thing, and you're acting on your conscience, you're bearing witness, which is the right thing to do, but bearing witness in the fullest sense of helping. So when the Chinese activists liberate all the dogs in the truck, that's an example of really fully bearing witness. What we do is only partially bearing witness. Um, but on the other hand, we are doing things like we're challenging what's called the distancing effect. In globalization, uh, you know, corporate globalization, there's a term called there's this process called distancing. So you you know you, you support child labor without knowing it because it's so distant and you know the different components are built in different parts. And so what we're doing with Barry's Witness is we're 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 stopping that distancing effect. So you know you go to the supermarket, you see some packaged meat. Well what we do with our vigils is we see the at the individuals before us. And there's we totally break that distancing effect. Um, so that's something very invaluable. Another source of feeling completely empowered is using a love-based approach to social change. And I can't emphasize this enough, um, how important it is. And I recommend to all of you, like recommend for all of you to read like Gandhi, King, Martin Luther King, Cesar Chavez, all the great community organizers that have used a non-violent, positive, love-based approach. Social change happens, I, I believe, faster if you use kindness and love towards all, including slaughterhouse workers, owners, managers, you know, mediators, whoever it is. Um, love and kindness works faster, and this has been, you know, this has been depicted in literature, like someone like uh, Charles Dickens. He, he, one of his books was um, David Copperfield. It was the most autobiographical book, and then he has two teachers: one that used corporal punishment, and where he didn't learn a thing, and another teacher that treated everyone like equals, and treated the, the students as absolute equals, and that's where he flourished. But I think that's just a general principle. It's how, how we learn. We're, we're more likely to learn if we're treated with respect and other kinds. Another source is just effective action. So that might mean increasing awareness, converting people to vegan. Today at our vigil, I think there were six of us, and uh, uh, one driver said, oh, they went veg because of our vigils. And we've heard that many times. Just because we're there all the time, people you know, begin to make the connection, they get some literature, we're planting seeds, some of them are converting. Um, uh, another one, effective act, example of effective action is getting other people to join, so new people to join, and that's what we're finding with the vigils. It's just, it's because we use a community organizing approach where, where they're out there every week, three times a week, and other successful social movements have done this. Cesar Chavez, uh, who started the United Farm Workers, when he first started, there was nobody who came to the meetings. It was really frustrating. There might be one or two people, and so he had to use it. What's, what's in social movement theory is called selective incentives. So like parties, dances, food. You would, you would, you would go knocking door to door, meet with, that's another technique, you knock on doors, you meet people face to face, meet them in their homes. Uh, then ask one of the, the people in the homes to organize their neighborhood and bring people out. So we use all these techniques. And um, uh, Also there's activism post-vigil, I think this talk about this as well, Michael, yesterday, about speaking out more, organizing other, um, so, sorry, uh, meeting for a coffee afterwards or, you know, having dinner, just getting people to get to know each other is, is, is one way. Um, so building community, meeting other people, I, I, I think another source of, you know, empowerment is, is meeting other people with lofty morals, like altruism, kindness, compassion, selflessness. Um, <laughs> And, and um, at vigil supporting activists, with, with, whether it's with hugs, when, you know, when people are crying, or food. I mean, someone like Agnes often brings food for all of us. 
uh, rides and carpools, and, um, and you know, some people have said it's going to vigils is better than going to church. I'll second that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, a lot of uh, several people. <laughs> I agree. Tolstoy on action. So I just wanted to say a couple of things. Uh, so there's one thing: thinking, you know, having thoughts, and saying all are equal. Animals are equal to us, and I'm vegan as a result. But there's a difference between just thinking and acting. And uh, Tolstoy wrote many, uh, many nonfiction books that are philosophical and very, very powerful. And one of them was called What I Believe, or alternatively, it's called My Religion. And it was uh, published after he wrote At Confession, which uh, at around the age of 50, he was suicidal. And he was always, he just thought life was a senseless joke, and what's the point of living, and you know, uh, there's just so much injustice, and what's my life, and you know, if I die, who would, who would I care anyways, right? And what's, what's the use of my present and future actions? So he had all these questions. So he said, above all, in his book, My Religion, do not have recourse to violence. And he said, his, Jesus' practice is easy. He, he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So Jesus had these, um, uh, just to clarify, he wasn't, he didn't believe in resurrection. He just believed Jesus was a man with some good ideas, as was Buddha, as, was, as were other figures. But what he, what he wanted to point out is Jesus had really high standards, moral standards, like, turning the other cheek, just, uh, you know, very, uh, helping the poor, getting rid of all his wealth, not having property, and so forth. And, and yet, he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And, and so this is sort of a counter argument to this whole uh, panel here. Like, it's not about burnout. Actually, you can be Jesus-like and you can say that line, right? And uh, so Tolstoy says of his own life, I was taught to judge and inflict punishment. In fact, he, he, he played a role, on, he, he was a, a judge for a short time, and he goes, but then he sort of challenges all that. He goes, the command, resist not evil, is the central point of Jesus' doctrine. What he, what he means by that is like violently resisting. Um, so in Tolstoy's The Kingdom of God is within you, he, 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 he talks about turning the other cheek, using love and kindness, and always nonviolence. And he said, as Jesus said, he came here to save people rather than judge them. And in our approach when we go to the slaughterhouses, if you, if you keep that in your mind, because it's very easy to get angry at, at, at slaughterhouse workers and owners and managers, very, very easy, or meat eaters. But if you come with this totally different perspective, that you're coming here to save them and not judge them, and who are you to judge? I mean, you, do, you know, if you live in a glass house, you don't throw stones. Uh, so distance, so, um, with respect to the distancing effect, Tolstoy writes about uh, military administrative machinery which divides responsibility so no one's responsible or accountable. So, you know, you can murder in war, but there's no accountability or, you know, responsibility. Whereas you would never do that kind of thing in, in, a, more, in a domestic scene. So he goes, how is that possible? And he, he talks about this division in uh, administrative uh, machinery. Um, in, in a confession, as I said, uh, he asks questions like, what will come of what I do today and tomorrow? What is the meaning of life beyond space and time and the relation between the finite and infinite? And how am I to live? So that's always in all his books. And he goes, this was the answer he provides in a confession towards the end in chapter 11. He says, I aired not so much what I thought, but how I lived. So he was a man who was always struggling with this issue how I lived. He was pretty moral, he was, but he was also very immoral, as was typical of his class. You know, so he was involved in all sorts of debauchery and possibly rape. You know, of, of peasant women. You know, all sorts of things that he was involved in. Uh, and uh, and and then, but he was also very good. Like he set up schools for the the, uh, the serfs and so forth. Yet he was still really struggling by the age of 50. And then he had a complete transformation. He actually got rid of his property. He went vegetarian. He stopped sports hunting. He, he just had a complete transformation. He started to dress like the peasants. He, he started to work on the land. So he, 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 he cleaned. He, um, um, he, was, he didn't believe in having servants. All, he just was, it was a complete transformation. And, and he started, in other words, he was acting different. He wasn't just professing these ideas. And for all of us, 
like, I know personally I'm acting different since Strong Pig Save started. Like, that's actually my priority in life, and I'm spending a lot of time doing it, and I've never been happier. You know, and I'm not focusing on other goals, which I could have been focusing on. Um, so he says, desperation ar arises from not seeing the changes you want to see. It, ari it arises from not acting and living the way you ought to. Um, in his book, My Religion, he also says, I recognize my fellowship with the whole world. There is truth only in action. By introducing light into the conscience of everyone, that is our life work truth and love will live forever. So his answer to the question about, you know, you know, what, what's the purpose of, you know, what should I do today and tomorrow, why does it matter? Well, the only thing that lives after you die is truth and love and, and the way you've contributed to those things. Nothing else matters. Um, so, um, So in terms of process, so I talked about, you know, goals, in terms of, how much time do I have left? Uh, <laughs> 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 I'll stop, sorry. No, no, like, why don't you just make a okay. summary? That would be nice, just to tie a bow on it, then, you know. <laughs> okay. Um, so in terms of process, uh, he, he really made, he advocated a love-based approach in what I believe, or my religion, and he said, God said, do no evil, and evil will cease to exist. Because we sometimes have debates about tactics, and you know, so it's okay to be mean to a meat eater because you know, an evil does not cancel out another evil. It simply does not. So actually, I do have you know. So he, he was very clear on this. He said, um, and he goes, "Was it really that simple? Is it really so simple?" He goes, "The advance of humanity towards righteousness is due not to the tyrants, but to the martyrs, as fire cannot extinguish fire, so evil cannot suppress evil." Good alone, confronting evil and resisting its contagion, can overcome evil. It is not violence, but, the, but good that overcomes evil. And the true source of happiness is fellowship and love. I cannot separate myself from others, and that was a theme that we talked about as community. Um, and quote, I believe now that my true welfare and that of others is only possible when I labor, not for myself, but for another. So it's, it's like service to others. That's your purpose in life. That's the purpose of everyone's life. It's not about me or, you know, helping myself, it's about service to others, uh, but for another, and that I must not refuse to labor for another, but give with joy that of which he has need. This faith has changed my estimate of what is right and important and wrong and despicable. So in other words, um, uh, the key is to live for others and to do it with joy and to give with joy those who have, have need. And also what he defines love as being able to love someone and not expecting anything Sure. So that's almost that's a type of unconditional love, which many of us may have been lucky enough to experience with parents, or you know. So I think I think that's a very important form of just to try to think about in, in our approach. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Thanks. Thank when Ian asked if I would take part in this, I thought what I could do mostly is not talk for 15 minutes, but just um, say that I can contribute in the form of later on when we're, you know, you're asking questions. Uh, I can probably answer a lot of your questions. I will say that not, I won't be answering them scientifically. Um, I've, I've been a frontline activist for over a decade now. Um, factory farms, fur farms, you name it. Um, sea Shepherd, I've been to a lot of places where I've had a lot of adrenaline and heartache. Um, and uh, so I can give a lot of subjective advice and hopefully it'll be help, helpful to you and that's that's how I see I can I can be the most useful here um, <clears throat> I did take a few notes and actually something we haven't touched on yet which I, I can speak to is um, is the physiological aspects of trauma oh I should say that um, I was diagnosed with PTSD a few years ago because I had spent so much time on the front lines and um, so I do have first-hand experience with being diagnosed and and slowly recovering from that and becoming a much 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 happier person, and um, I can tell you what that process was like, but um, physiologically, we haven't talked about that yet, and when we're talking about trauma, it's, you know, what's going on up here, but uh, what's going on up here really affects our bodies, and we don't really think about that. We, we often ignore what our bodies are telling us. What everyone here in this room knows is that there's an emergency happening 24-7 around the globe with animals, and we live with that, and we carry that, and that produces adrenaline. 
and it produces, uh, you know, we get the shakes, we, have, we end up with irritable bowel syndrome and all sorts of things. And so um, something that I had to learn was to listen to my body and to see that when I was becoming in a, in a um, like fight or flight, that's often how, we, how physiologically we respond when we see the pigs at, at uh, you know, when we're bearing witness or we're in a situation where we're just feeling really upset because we're seeing a lot of fur, we're seeing our family eating meat in front of us, we get um, these bursts of adrenaline and because we care so much and we're so passionate, that's happening all the time. And it's proven that that can just, that can cause um, depression, um, living in a state of adrenaline all the time. So something that I've learned to do is to, when I feel the adrenaline rising, to be aware of it and to calm down because that can cause burnout. And that's part of what caused my burnout was um, existing in a state of adrenaline is exhausting. And most of the time we don't even know we're doing it. We're not paying attention. So if I can give any advice um, about that, start paying attention to your, to your bodies and, and, and try and, and bring yourself down. Uh, because you'll be extending your life, literally, <laughs> you'll be extending your lifespan and uh, extending your life as an activist as well. Is um, you know, adrenaline is part of what extended adrenaline is a part of what makes us burn out. Um, and speaking of speaking of adrenaline and, and physiological responses, and uh, that's about energy as well, and what we're giving our, our energy to. And um, I gone you know, around the gamut of what I've given my attention to um, in the last 15 years. When we become activists and sensitized and vegans, usually we're really, really angry uh, at the world. And I'm still angry at the world. But um, there's, a, there's this native saying, um, an elder is talking to his grandson, and he says, um, there's there's always a war going on in my mind and it's between two wolves and one wolf is really angry and the other wolf is, is really happy and they're always warring and um, the grandson says well who wins and the man says the one I feed and <clears throat> I remind myself of this a lot and um, I you know I'm, I'm I'm very angry very angry about what's going on and how animals are treated but I don't feed that and I don't live in that pain because I did, and I did burn out, and I did suffer. And um, I, I put up some healthy blocks to that, um, because I existed there, and, and it's, it's not sustainable. It brings the adrenaline. Uh, it makes us exhausted. And so we can, we can acknowledge in a healthy way, like there's bad blocks and there's good blocks to, to coping and dealing with the suffering in the world. Um, bad blocks, I would say, are... Um, La, 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 like, oh God, that hurts, like, okay, okay, I'm gonna go and distract myself with something else, but a good block would be, that's awful, that's disgusting, but I can't give my energy to it right now because I can't change that. This is a catastrophe, and I can't give my energy to it because that's gonna burn me out, I'm gonna be exhausted, and I can't change that, so I have a lot of barriers now, like after, you know, going to factory farms, I can't be crying my eyes out before, after, and during about what I'm seeing, though I would I would like to, but you know I I, I put up I put up blocks and um, and that's healthy and that allows me to go go forward. And some people we could talk about that. Some people think oh don't block at all like don't block the emotions. And the emotions are what you know propel us forward and that's good. So I'm not saying block all the emotions, but you can always do yourself a favor and have some some walls up and some blockages and and say I'm going to be good to myself tonight and I'm not going to or this week I'm not going to live in the pain. Um, I'm going to feed. I'm going to feed the happy wolf, and not uh, not the angry wolf, um, and that has allowed me to go forward. And will you know that's allowed me to continue going forward. Um, you guys have talked about some of the other things, um, so that's good. Um, energy, and um, also about energy and the angry anger we carry. Um, it's hard not to be angry about all the fur and all the, you know, the fur trim everywhere, and um, and I'm angry about that too. But I actively um, work with myself to not focus the anger on the individuals, the person on the streetcar, um, you know, my sister who still eats meat. Like I, I've um, I've really stepped back, and um, and we have finite energy, and it's really really precious. 
And so to focus on one individual, um, you know, I know I did that forever. My mom, my mom just kept eating. You know, how can you know all the issues? Leave that, like Shanti, Shanti. <laughs> just, um, I find that, you know, planting seeds. And I think that's a better way than like, you know, doing this and we all kind of can't help but do that because we're so angry we want that person and that person to change. But, you know, they're on their own path and we have to remember that. So let people be on their own path and do yourself and your heart and your adrenaline and a favor by um, lifting that and, and being less angry, actively working at being less angry and planting seeds and living by example and always being compassionate and kind. And like Anita said, everything should be driven from love and kindness and truth. And, and I'm always working at it, like always reminding myself every day, don't be angry. Your energy is finite and your energy is precious. And we have a really big mission, each of us here, that we're working on. And, um, and just focus on the big picture and not on like what grandma's eating tonight and stuff like that. It's infuriating, but if you give it the energy, you're gonna deplete the energy that's more useful for big picture stuff. I wanna recommend this book. This is um, like, this is the Bible as far as I'm concerned in, in terms of, um, well, it's called Aftershock, Confronting Trauma in a Violent World. And uh, I, it's totally dog-eared and full of notes now. And it really spoke to me. And it's written by Patrice Jones. And it's about, it's for people who are compassionate and who are frustrated and who um, don't know how to navigate all these feelings that we have. Uh, I've turned to this book time and time again. And I would encourage you all to, uh, to pick it up. It's called Aftershock. There's another one here about not burning out. Um, I've read bits of it, and it's very good. It's called The Lifelong Activist by Hilary Rettig. And, uh, and so anyway, put those on your list uh, if, you, if you need some resources. And again, if you, want, if you have questions later, that's, that's, that's why I'm here. <laughs> I want to first say I, I agreed with everything Anita said except for one thing, uh, which was, I think the bearing witness is deontological. It's not but anyway, that's a debate. I think everything that you said was really good. And everybody, everybody said it. So, um, so uh, first of all, uh, I was sent this very nice uh, statement, I'll read, that it was in relation to this class. Uh, I don't know who wrote this, but uh, compassion hurts when you feel connected to everything. You also feel responsible for everything. You cannot turn away. Your destiny is bound with the destinies of others. You must either learn to carry the universe or be crushed by it, which is, sounds a lot like things that you were saying, you know, you're good blocks. You must grow strong enough to love the world, yet empty enough to sit down at the same table with its worst horrors. And actually, Gandhi was really moved by another uh, a similar lesson from the Bhagavad Gita about the, uh, the lesson of Arjuna, uh, because he was about to enter into battle and he wanted to, he felt conflicted over it. And Arjuna, who's, uh, I mean, Krishna advised him to say, uh, you know, essentially be in the world but not of it, and also to um, to uh, not be attached to the fruits of your uh, the, late, the fruits of your actions. So don't think about the consequences; just do what's right. It's essentially, Gandhi found that very profound. And that kind of is a good segue into what I wanted to say here, and you can come off the other time. But anyway, um, first of all, the activist guilt. A lot of people um, feel they're not doing enough for the animals, and uh, but then you know, and they're conflicted because there's a principle that an activist will necessarily feel, which is act as if the fate of the whole world depended on your actions. Constantly, and that brings up the problem of under witnessing. Um, I mean, of course, we all have responsibility, uh, freedom, as uh, was said earlier. We have the responsibility to be their voice and they don't. So that, that huge crushing burden. But at the same time, it has to be held in check, like the, the good blocks. Um, and, you, and the way I've expressed it is you have to take time out from activism, uh, either in daily life or even a long period of stretch, to do reflection. And this reflection is a common uh, theme in, in, uh, for the peace activists as well. They take time, they actually say, okay, I'm going to take this number of months off to do reflection. Or uh, uh, monastics is do that as well. And, but you can do a reflection every day and renewal every day, like uh, 
somebody mentioned love, well, it can be very, um, love can be just like hugging your dog. So Buddy and I have a good hug every day and never ends me. Uh, or you can hug another primate, too. Uh, and that's renewing. Um, see, uh, I do think it's important to identify as an activist. Think of yourself as a lifelong animal rights activist and a calling. It's a sacred mission, it's a calling. So that means, since it's your calling, you can take time out and you'll come back to it later. And uh, you, it's not like uh, it's gonna go away. Wherever you go, it's gonna be there. Um, another issue, when I burn out before, I've been in like five social justice movements. Now, when I burn out, it's been over factionalism and disappointment, you know, Carolyn talked about earlier. And definitely, you'll always feel there will be always people that rub you the wrong way in the movement, always. Although I would add, the animal rights movement is less that way than others. Really? That I've been in. Yeah. <laughs> 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 anyway, um, yeah, you know, anyway. Uh, so it's, um, <laughs> this is a great movement. This is like very supportive and wonderful by comparison to some stuff. Okay. So yeah, and I, as a result, I've spent a lot of years as a, what I would call a lone activist because I didn't have a sense of community, but I did it anyway because it's my calling. It's what I, uh, who I am or what I am called to do in life. And uh, more than important than anything, right? And, um, and whether, it, if, if it's your calling, you do it, whether or not you have a supportive community, but it really is nice when there is one, of course. Um, there are also recognized there's many AR movements, not just one. So pick the one that fits you best. And, and it often takes time, even years, to find the group, the movement, the sub-movement within the movement, uh, or the peoples. Now, luckily, I, you know, I met Anita and uh, Agnes and others, and, and Ian Purdy, who now that's my movement. And it's the nonviolent movement. It's the I, a movement that involves reflection and insight is the movement that involves bearing witness, and I feel strongly about that. Um, also, pace yourself and find your niche. Somebody mentioned the word niche before, that's very important. Um, I remember a guy, I'm not gonna say names, but he was came into the movement, he was like full of anger, full of passion, really great stuff, you know, we did a lot of stuff together, and then he was like quit, inexplicably, and disappeared. I'm like, what happened to this guy, right? He was around for one year or something? Well, obviously, that's not the way to do it. You pace yourself, uh, and you don't expect immediate results. Um, you know, mentioned uh, an Aboriginal uh, lesson. Another one that I've heard, and you might have heard, is uh, real change takes seven generations, right? So if you're in a war and you're a soldier, do you think that you're going to actually defeat the entire enemy in one go, in one battle? No, you're, you're part of a larger effort, and uh, so got to recognize that, not to, you know, sorry for the militaristic analogy, but um, uh, so it does require balance with personal life, and I don't feel guilty about giving time to my personal life. Uh, I used to, but I don't anymore because, um, because uh, you know, as a lot of you have said, if I, if I don't do that, then, you know, I can be like that guy, and I, that's a tendency to me, is to go all out you know, 16 hours a day, everything, you don't sleep, you don't bathe, and you're just like all, oh. and, then, and then, you, uh, and then you're, you're, then you're actually viewed as a crazy person, and you're not effective at all, but, uh, uh, so just, so I'd say, even if you give half an hour a day to the animals, and that's, that's not a lot, but if you give half an hour, that's good, and does Facebook count? That's a big question. Uh, I think it does, if you're converting people on it, and you're sharing petitions, and you're, adding important thoughts, it does count. Uh, it's been actually very beneficial to the movement. Um, so another issue is the burden uh, of this knowledge is so suck, causes such suffering on the person. Um, put it, that into context though. That's a problem, it's a, you know, some people call it the Odyssey problem, like uh, the problem of evil in the world. It predates animal rights activism and it's impossible for you or you or you to solve it um, you will short circuit uh, to use this you know uh, you know if you're like an Android analogy if you try to if you try to solve that problem you cannot solve it. there are a lot of philosophers who tried to solve it. 
uh, you can, so you put it aside. It's you put the good block on it, I love that. And, um, and also it's with the growing community, it does become possible. So you have to have somebody use the word faith, like Carolyn did. Faith is a great word here. Faith is a belief in something unseen, and the unseen is our the positive end that we seek. And you have to have faith in it, or else it won't happen. And if you don't have faith in it, it certainly won't happen. Um, and it does happen in little ways that you have to look for and be attuned to uh, when we convert, when we have a God-positive talk with a slaughterhouse worker, when somebody becomes a vegan. Uh, if I convince my department to use vegan ice cream instead of real ice cream, little things like that do make a difference. Um, and it's surprising uh, if you're attuned to the little things how encouraging they can be. Um, so you have to set aside that huge question, the billions suffering, like Brenda said, and you have to focus on the what is positive uh, and take heart from that. Um, and it is an endless process. Um, the uh, three, minutes. three minutes, yeah. So, um, so the I want to talk about another philosophical word. You mentioned deontology. The one I like is non-consequentialism, which is the same thing. Um, let me put it this way, uh, the way we live, like Tolstoy said, the way we, how we live is as important as the end result, maybe even more. Uh, so there's a moral imperative to avoid defeatism and pessimism, and a moral duty to be optimists, not wishful thinkers. And there's a difference between that. I think one of the things that I try to avoid is uh, sectarianism, factionalism, fundamentalism, Insularism, uh, all big words for um, thinking that you're always right and everybody is always wrong, and uh, trying to bridge with other movements and other people, uh, and also deepening the insight within the movement, um, having a faith that positive change is a long-term project. It will extend beyond the life of any single person, but you're part of it, just like the civil rights movement. They had to have that faith for that to succeed. Every effort counts. Signing a petition counts. It doesn't not count because, again, Kant, the philosophy of the goodwill. It's even if you had, could never act on your goodwill, it still matters. Uh, I always told that to my 90-year-old grandmother, you know, who in her end of her life, because she said, "I, I'm useless. I'm no good." And I said, "No, you have, you have a beautiful soul. You're a wonderful person, and you've done so much in your life, and that matters. And the fact that you still want to do good matters." And that it does, even if nobody else recognizes it, but I recognize it. And um, uh, so we all die eventually. The world will die eventually, sooner or later. And uh, what matters is how we live, not how long. Um, imagine yourself in a death camp. This is a harsh analogy, but everybody will die. Does it matter what the person does in the death camp? Yes. Uh, it does matter if they treat others kindly, even if nobody gets out alive. It matters not to be what is called the Sondra Commando, the ones who facilitated it, and because they betrayed their own souls. Um, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? That's in the New Testament. I love that one. Uh, so signing a petition, it matters. You know, whether the, uh, whatever the outcome, because you're doing it with the good soul, the good heart, the good will, right? Uh, Jesus had an analogy, the widow's might. Um, she, she gave more um, by giving the little that she had than the rich man who gave the little. Uh, he gave, you know, he gave more money, but not with the goodwill. She gave it with the goodwill. That matters. That meant more to God. Um, would you be a vegan if no one, even if no one else in the world was? Uh, I would, because it matters what I do, whatever the world does, right? Um, so, I, I, the, the other, let's see, many activists neglect themselves, I've done that, uh, exercise, that's practical, take time to do that, think of yourself as an animal who is in need, would you, would you not, uh, would you deny a dog the exercise that they need every day? Uh, if you don't exercise and, and, and renew yourself spiritually, you're like abusing a dog. And the dog is you. Um, <laughs> that's animal abuse. That's very bad. Um, so your actions matter, no matter how small, and it is an endless process. 
Uh, I also, one last point, I always look for new ways to express it, to use my creativity, because faith is the act of the total person, the physical self, the emotional self, the intellectual self. I always look for these new creative ways to do it. So recently I found the posters on Facebook thing, I got Photoshop and I did that, <laughs> and then I'll do something else later. And the, the new ways of doing activism really is fun, and I enjoy that. So those are a few tips. philosophy of bearing witness, I mean, was it immediate or was it, like, was where you are now? Because the ideology actually seems quite cohesive at this point, but it didn't start at that point. So, so, I don't want you, I know it's probably too complicated to chart the route, but were there some milestones along the way that yeah, led you to where you are? Yeah, there are many milestones. Like, um, I think. Uh, when we first started, we just knew we had to gather footage, and we had art shows, and you were part of that, and we had monthly potlucks. And then Peter did a, um, a meat, a human meat tray, and I had gone to Lakeshore and Strawn to take some footage because I was doing a video for Ravel, and then that was the first time I bore witness in the truck, and I couldn't believe it. It was like just so profound. I actually, profa I promised that day that I would do like three vigils, a minimum of three vigils a week to the pigs, and. Um, and bearing witness is so, it's such a huge and powerful strategy that it takes years, I, th I think it takes years to get it. I mean, Joanne knows, you know, we've been for a decade, but I think it takes a long time to even get what, what, what all the implications of bearing witness are. And I think what's distinctive about our group is that it's a very democratic approach where we say collectively bear witness. That all of us, every single person has a duty to bear witness, and it's not something for just investigators or and we all have to be our first, first hand witness of the animals and the individuals before us. And to me, that the figure, you know, like 700 million animals, I think, yes, let's tackle that figure. That's what I like about it. Let's tackle that figure. What does it mean? Let's break it down. So, quality meat packers is, you know, a million and a half pigs a, a year. It's, it's, uh, it's six, you know, Louise put on the poster, seven, seven thousand or six thousand pigs a week. Yeah, let's tackle it. Each truck, 210. We're, we're witnessing what? Let's add it up. This is what it means. I think we have a responsibility to tackle those numbers, break them down, and um, so bearing witness is all these things. And it's such a huge strategy that you could write, I believe, books on it. And I, I, I mean, other movements have used this strategy. Quakers, uh, they they bought a, a, a sailboat called the Golden Rule in the 1950s. They tried to sail. They didn't make it, but they tried to sail in the South Pacific. Later, Greenpeace was successful and tried tried to bear witness and go to Ground Zero where the nuclear tests were being conducted. Um, and so this, and bearing witness was done by you know, Martin Luther King, and it has different forms. So in his case, he chose Birmingham after um, bus boycott was in, so it was in where? Sorry? Was Montgomery. Montgomery, right, the Montgomery bus boycott. Then the next place, the next site he chose for action was Birmingham because that was the place where there was a great number of church burnings and murders. And, and it was, it was, uh, Bull O'Connor was the police chief and it was very aggressive. And so they chose that site because there was so much violence. And it's important to be to go to the site of greatest injustice. And that's why when we bear witness, we go to the site because that's the greatest source of greatest site of injustice. And then after he achieved this the voting act uh, in 1965, then he went to live in the slum areas of um, Chicago because there was all these this housing discrimination. And so he took his whole family to live there, uh, and like, there was no front door, and you know, homeless people would pee in the like, hallways, and he, he, he took his whole family to live there, even though he was a middle, came from a middle class family. So that's an example of bearing witness. And the way we applied it to Toronto Cow Save is we did a 30 hour vigil where we actually slept overnight at the slaughterhouse. That felt like real solidarity. That was, we good. Were, that was good. Yeah, we were sleeping there. It was like, I, it felt, you know, and it smelled terribly, and we we're just experiencing a small portion of what the cows experience in the pens that night. And so when we when we do more and more solidarity and deeper bearing witness, that's why I said bearing witness, it could be partial. And when we're at Pig Island, it's a partial form, but it can be fuller. And that involves more sacrifice, might you know, way more sacrifice. And if we were in those trucks, we would want way more sacrifice from other people. Because we, we there's no almost no consequences for us. It's not like we're resisting, you know, the fascists or the Nazis and you know, if we resist, we're going to be shot or hung. 
we, we, we face no con like almost no consequences. In fact, we get, oh great, you're doing a great job, you know? That's what we get. And are we doing a great job? Uh, you know, we try. We minor problems that we face, but by and large, we live an incredibly privileged life. And we can do a lot more. And uh, we, we don't sacrifice a lot. It sounds like yeah. um, it's evolving. It's still evolving. Oh, it's such a, yeah, it's such a big, <clears throat> bearing witness is such a huge concept. It's becoming a lot now. It's another kind of continent. But isn't that an emotional sacrifice to some extent? Like for myself, what, it took me a long time to come out to the very first vigil. I knew about, I've been in touch with you and other members of the vigil group. And, and you know, I've even written in the group, you know, I will come one day, I just can't do it right now. And so I think it's a matter of people being able to um, come to terms with what they are witnessing and how it will affect them, especially the first time. And um, I think that's probably the thing that's the most fearsome for people, is to be able to, how, how are you going to react and deal with it? And even though you know it's very important to be there to witness, but to be able to deal with it emotionally is an impact. And I think once you overcome that, you can move on. That's how it was for me anyway. Yeah. Um, because uh, you, know, you talked about you've been different places, and you've been directly bearing witness, you know, similar to, to um, when you see the trucks, but you've been in Solaris and all the various things. And then the doc is documented in, in the animals, the book, the Ghost in Our Machine. And I was thinking about um, the actor who's passed away now, it, who acted in the killing fields. And he, was a doc he, was, he was a doctor, he wasn't even an actor by profession, he was a doctor. And he was Cambodian, and he acted in the film, and he couldn't see the film because the film was like reliving what he had. And, and so I guess I'm wondering, you're, because what, I'm wondering, does it feel like you relive it when you, like you see, because they're your photos, I mean, it's literally your eyes, right? And, and when I see things, it's horrible enough when I see things on the net, but I actually wasn't the one taking that. Usually I'm not, you know, I'm not the one taking that photo. So how do you deal with that kind of, it's a lot. Yeah. But that goes back to healthy blocks as well. Right. It's not only am I shooting the pictures and meeting hundreds of thousands of animals and um, leaving them behind, but that, that's my job every day is that I'm working with my own archive of 10 years every single day. So um, I don't, uh, and this shouldn't go for everyone, but for me, about healthy barriers, uh, I don't look at new footage that's coming out all the time unless I'm I, I read about it and I see that I'm going to learn something new from it. Um, so I try and limit my amount and also uh, look but not feel, like look in an educational way. <laughs> like when you see your own stuff, does it not take you back to? Sometimes. But you're able but then, to. But then I, I, like I said, I'm always working on choosing and not just following where my head wants to go or um, where the anger wants to go. It's a constant choosing of this sucks, or I have to take a look at this right now, but I'm not gonna go go into it with my heart and, and my anger and, and dwell there. So over and over, every day, I'm choosing to, um, to put up some healthy barriers so that I can have more energy for the work I need to do. But I, I mean, that, that probably took a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I think I had to go through depression and, and learn, some, learn some skills for looking after myself and, and uh, when we get into negative thinking, which is easy with all the bearing witness that we're doing, um, it's like a rut, like our, our minds going through us as well, and you can just start thinking about things all the time, like the people that we're having dramas with in our lifetimes, our mothers, our best friends, whatever, we just think about it all the time, we get into these ruts, so you have to think about what you're thinking about, yeah, and, and observe what you're thinking about, and choose, always choosing <laughs> to not think about, about that, and it's, it's active, it's very proactive. <laughs> And also the physiological stuff, being healthy, um, and how, how I got over depression was really, really simple stuff. And people don't want to know that it's simple, but it was sort of was for me. I had some tools, but also you just have to admit that you need sleep, <laughs> and you need to take your vitamins. And by vitamins, I mean either like actual vitamins or really, really healthy food. Like you know, don't don't be an animal, a self animal abuser. You know, our bodies, <laughs> our bodies need certain things in order to go forward. And, like you can't get out of thinking about awful things if you're underslept, 
especially if you're underslept. So really, really basic things, drinking enough water. I mean, geez, that's almost too easy. But uh, it really, those things will like help you get ahead <laughs> of, um, of, how, of how you're feeling and give you like tools. <laughs> Just one thing that's not been mentioned is supporting, say, the big uh, national organizations if you don't think that you're being effective as an individual. Mm -hmm. You can support people, people like Mercy for Animals or TBA or you know, the Association for Defenders, even small monthly donations if you can afford it. So, mm -hmm. And if, if, you, if you personally can't do anything enough, you know, then at least you can think for a little bit of your money is doing something. Mm -hmm. Question for Brenda. So, one aspect of your situation that's unique is that you form relationships with a lot of them, especially emotional bonds, and then these things may die or become sick. So, I'm wondering about how you handle that piece of the, you know, the road that you're on. Well, we, we did, we just lost uh, Wally, uh, one of our beloved pot belly pigs. It was very painful. Um, he came in horrific. He just came from a terrible situation. He, he looked, he, had, he, had, he was, his skin was hanging off, his nails were so long he couldn't stump, he was stumbling around, he could barely walk, he, his sight was, was half gone, I, I don't know what was wrong with his eyes. Um, but he came around and he, he, he developed this little trot, it was just sort of his little wally walk around the paddock and he, he we really loved him. and. Um, what, and, and we were there, of course, with him when we had the vet come. We had to make the decision. It was for, it was a gift that we could give him. He was suffering, and um, so we could choose that for our animals, right? That we can't choose for for our people. Um, but um, we know that for the year and a half that he was with us, he knew love. He blossomed, um, and we did everything that we could. And that, that's that's all we know that whatever we're doing. For for our animal family is what we can, and that they, as short as it may be, or God willing, as long as it will be, they will have known nothing but love and, and, and care. Um, and that, that assuages any, you know, any, if we want to develop a memorial garden, we want to create a nice space because uh, each one obviously brings their own, their own <coughs> color character to the place and, uh, and we wouldn't our family wouldn't be the same without each individual it's not like it's not like we have sheep like there's not a flock of sheep there's matri and smudge and freckles I mean each you know they're individuals and they all have their own personalities and, and they're treated as such and we benefit by that I think the idea of a memorial garden you know, a terrible infection we don't know what the cause of it was but you know just wasting away it's, uh, a number of people mentioned spirituality. I was just wondering, just kind of referenced it in passing, but I was wondering if anybody, for any of the panelists, whether that's an important part of your health is having a spiritual life. Me? Yeah. And of course, spirituality has uh, different uh, faces, but uh, I would have the same as you, that's for sure. Rob is my husband. <laughs> <laughs> so you had to say that. Yeah. <laughs> you set her up. No, actually, but, um, no, I didn't. But I was actually rest. just surprised how many times so that, that yes. people reference, or you know, sometimes it's just referencing yeah, Jesus. Jesus but, um, yeah, Jesus. Yeah. For other people, it's a figure, but also, so, yeah. And um, Paul quoted. Yeah. Like, I think I'm an atheist, but. Uh, uh, I think even Tolstoy was in a way, and he was, he was, what he was attracted to was something that lives forever, which I think is love and truth. So I'm not sure what that means, but I believe, I believe, well, I actually see those forces. Like I see those forces in my dog, Mr. V, which I got from my mom. I actually see part of her in him, and I know the kindness that my mother showed me actually lives on all the time. And I also often think of her when I'm low and try to get her energy. And so I think those kind of forces live forever. And whether that's God, I mean, that's what Tolstoy said. He said, God is love. So maybe that's how I understand it. It sounds like, like and I think Brenda talks to reference to reincarnation, 
about talking about yourself. I don't know whether that was just a metaphor or whether you actually believe it. No, I, well, I don't know. I can't prove that it doesn't exist, so it certainly is, is possible. But I, I do believe fundamentally, I mean, in our logo on the Mission Law Sanctuary, it says in connection with all. And that's not an intellectual exercise. That's something that I profoundly believe that we're all connected. And, um, and that so we are part of something much larger than any one of us individually. So us together, plus, you know, whatever, whatever is out there, that, that we're all energy. So it, it is, and, and we all, I think, in some ways talked about faith. So faith in something greater than ourselves, um, which is a spirituality. So yeah, I would not say religious, but spiritual. In fact, I think every single person referenced faith or the Bible or Jesus. So which is, I found really fascinating. Huh. Well, I, I say that uh, <clears throat> animal rights and morality is in social justice. That is my religion, mm -hmm. and uh, and in so far as uh, traditional religions uh, go along in that direction towards morality, I agree with them. And where they deviate from that, I disagree with them, because um, that's the that's the standard uh, by which I assess those traditions. And um, and and it's a very high standard, right? It's uh, it's the highest standard of all, and it's, and, and it's actually uh, you know if you look at Paul Tillich or his work, it, um, you know faith is ultimate concern, and that involves the entire person, their mind, their body, their soul, everything, their mind, their intellect, their and um, and what and what is and, and moral faith is one of the highest expressions of it. There's many types of faith that are idolatrous, but moral faith is is the highest, if not one of the highest, if not the highest. It's the one that speaks to me. Um, you know, the Hindus have uh, the three. They have um, the uh, Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga, and um, Jnana Yoga. Bhakti Yoga is love. Uh, karma Yoga is action, and um, Yana yoga is is uh, using your mind to discover the truth, and um, you know I'd say a good animal rights activist uses all three: their heart, their mind, and their action, their body, and that involves the whole person. And um, there's many ways of doing it. So um, I uh, I grew up in the United Church, and uh, but I wouldn't say that I I wouldn't identify as a Christian in the same way that I understood that anymore, what I would say is that I, I, I uh, look up to Jesus' teachings as a great example of uh, moral faith that I truly believe in and I think it's the most important thing. And, uh, and uh, you know, from other, other traditions as well. Um, it's a big, big topic you opened up there. <laughs> you teach a whole course on it, so I'm not going to... Yeah, so we're not going to get into all of it, but it, it, it is, I would say, and I tell the students too, this is my religion. So I'm pretty up, up front about that. This is my complete conviction you know, in life. And the family question. How do we deal with our family? I'm just thinking I have a godmother who's in a nursing home in Australia, 20,000 kilometers away, and there's a rabid Christian, like, raven. You can't, every second word is whatever, you know. And over five years, I've got her to address the topic of animals. But it's glacial movement. <laughs> She's in her early 90s now. But I, and I, our job isn't to, you know, be messy and with every family member, but every one of us has a family, and this issue is pretty much on our t-shirt all the time. How do you have any tips for how each of you deal with it and without being too personal? Yes, my husband and I separated. <laughs> <laughs> and that story. <laughs> it did. It was an issue. It became a larger. It, it divide can, grew over time. Can a vegan live with a non-vegan? I, mean, I, mean, I, I know couples that won't well, marry if well, they don't settle that question. So you can pick those people. Very individual. You can pick those people, but you can't pick your great aunt. Yes, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Good point. So, for me, I don't worry about it. And I spent a lot of time worrying about what my family ate, and now I've chosen recently in the last two years just to not worry about what they eat. And then 
focus on planting the seeds of change generally in my life instead of those five people, that kind of thing. It's it just takes up too much energy. So it's also a form of adaptation. It's also a form of adaptation. So you, can, yeah. you know what I'm saying? It took a while <laughs> for me to adapt and to <laughs> relax. I don't think that's what you mean, though. Well, you know, you have to adapt to your environment. Mm -hmm. Like you said, you keep saying if you want to keep your energy for something that is purposeful, you have to choose, right? So I have a question for you. What is your what is your goal? Why? What is it? What's your purpose in? in like, why her? Yeah, well, I just wondered why you brought <laughs> Is that just as an example? Uh, it's, it's just an example, but okay. uh, the, the question is there's a certain uh, impulses like the moral duty, or several of you said the moral right. duty. Right. And these are uh, um, genetic and not legal relatives. I don't think know. we have moral duty to proselytize. I, I agree, but mm -hmm. they know we exist, and we know they exist. We know what they eat, we know what we feel, mm -hmm. and that's, that's a Instant, you can't not have the dialogue. That, that's why I'm asking the question. So right, I'm saying you have the dialogue, but you can agree and disagree. <laughs> oh, you feel like you've had a complete dialogue and continue doing what you feel is right. Um, I don't think you do have a duty. I think you have a duty to change absolutely everybody, particularly people that are close to you and your friends. So I actually think there's a positive duty that we have. I mean, if they were, if we were living maybe in the context of a human genocide, and they participated in rape and murder, then we, it would be a different picture. We, there's an incredible speciesism, and it's hard to avoid it because it's, there's so much animal abuse in the world. It's so predominant that we're living in the middle of it, so it's hard to sometimes see it. So actually, I totally agree with you. I think that, you know, my, in the case of my mother, she actually made fun of me for 10 years when I was vegetarian. And, um, we, and, and she, I, I always loved my mother. She was really close, but for, for some reason. But anyways, she got breast cancer. 12, 13 years ago, and then I did a lot of the shopping and stuff like that, and she went vegetarian and then vegan. And it was partly also because I did all the shopping. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but she changed as a person, and she was more committed to animals. And um, I just, I talked to everybody, my neighbors, my, and, and what I, the reason I brought the case of my mother up is that it might look impossible for people to change. They might make fun of you. They might not want to hear you. But keep on planting seeds. And it's up to you to be innovate, innovative in how you do it. So try yes. different methods. You know, and all love, you know, love based works better. Like films, you know, vegan food, bring food. You know, if you're, I, you know, I don't see the point of boycotting Thanksgiving. Like, go there and bring a beautiful vegan dish. Like, just keep at it. Just keep at it because they're part of your life. And animal rights is absolutely fundamentally important. So you've got to always have it there with you, but do it in a nice way. And you got to, and it's it's not responsible to say, well, I'm not going to deal with it. Uh, but it, not in a way that hurts you. I do it in a pot. If you do something with a love-based way, it actually it won't hurt you. When you, when you when you talk, to, it actually won't. So that's why love-based is so important. I'm pretty lucky in this because uh, I um, <clears throat> my uh, one of my brothers, my mother, and two of my sisters went either vegan or vegetarian. Um, and I the weird thing is, I never, I don't recall talking to them about it. But they knew where I stood, and I think that influenced them. Just the example. So, um, if you uh, and uh, my brother made fun of it in the first couple of years, and uh, and then the, he was the one that shocked me. When, well, he's not a full vegetarian. He's but he cut out, I think, chicken, cows, and things like that. And he, it just shocked me because he, you know, I just never expected him. But I, when my sister became a vegan, I. You know, I expected that, but not him. And my mother became vegetarian. I didn't expect that. So, and there's this one day they said, you know, guess what? And um, and I and that that really, but it took like ten years or something. It was a, it was a bit of a process uh, for them to come around. But I I don't recall ever actually pushing them on it. And uh, I did, but I made my views known. But I didn't say you should or something. Like that. So there's a difference. I think it's a really important, yeah. really important question for new new vegans, uh, because yeah. I think people think it's like what what are you eating? What do you? But it's not. It's particularly youth and so for the kids, because we have an eight year old and twelve year old, and they got their website. So twelve year old is always getting into discussions with her friends because she's a vegan and everybody. And 
and they're not very rational kind of well, not all the adults have rational ones either. So <laughs> um, you know, they're you know they they can be really difficult. But she'll have kids come up and say, "I want to be vegan," and, and of course they are they also have very little voice. So it's a very different world. They can't do the 30-day vegan challenge because they don't buy the groceries, they don't have the money, they don't make their meals. And uh, so we've been talking about what a difference it is because most of what we have out there is for adults. So as adults, we can kind of go, you know what, mom, I'm not going to see you as often. But when you're living in mom's house, <laughs> it's a very different world. And so um, and some of them giving up because, you know, they, they just... You know, they still want to eat. They don't really know how to, how to work it. So I, I think it's a really valid, like when we're talking to people right, and, and use, and we get past that initial stage of them realizing and them wanting to be vegan, the support they might need is, is that, is that answering that very question. Like, how do I remain friends? Like, you know, I remember Shimmy saying to me, you know, I'm going to lose friends, right? I feel like I'm going to lose friends. Like, I feel like, and I said, I, you know, I hope you don't. You might. I think I have. Like, I'm not sure I have. Um, he said not to worry about it, so I didn't have to worry about it. <laughs> but, uh, it, 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 you know, they, they have the exact same issues as adults. You know, they're smaller, but they're the exact same. You know, Rowan goes to a birthday party, and, and he's, we call him our conscience, because, you know, you find those people in the world that, that, that somehow have, the, I don't know, is it a moral bar or strength? And he'll go to a birthday party and come back and say he had a great time to play laser tag and I'll say, what did you eat? And he'll say nothing. Because uh, they had pizza and they had cake. And then he'll be very happy. <laughs> Ask if he can have some vegan ice cream and <laughs> he's unbothered because there's some bubble that he has to get there. So, you know, we look at that and say, okay, this kid, we, we got to use him. <laughs> right? Like, like, and so I, I think that... This is, this is your kid? Or? Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Actually, yeah. do you want to uh, share the website? Here. Yeah. I don't know if everyone knows that. Um, their website their is uh, made a website for children. For actually. children, yeah, it's a, a vegan website for kids, for kids by kids. I need to, I need to draw. Uh, you, you know what you raised is the, I think important. It's um, the difficulty that some children may face, and I think that's a more important issue than what we might face. In, in um, it's, it's it's actually got to the point where some people take their kids out of they do homeschooling. We had a panel on that last year. Because they don't really want those kids to be subjected to that uh, unfortunate peer pressure, and I know I've heard stories about kids who felt alone, uh, who were who chose to do this from an early age, and uh, themselves, not even their parents, and the amount of pressure that would have, would have must have been on them uh, is is great. So you raise an important point. I think it's the positive thing about that is that a movement that may have been predominantly adults initially, you know, is now young families. And so I've been asked by two or three mothers, you know, can you write something, not about recipes and stuff, like, we don't want recipes. What we want to know is how to deal with the teacher who whatever, right? Because we're kind of a tough family, I think, in some ways. So, you know, I've, I've done the letter to the teacher, really nice, very loving, very loving letter <laughs> saying, um, when you read a book like Little House on the Mountain or whatever, Very. Very. <laughs> well, one of the Little House books, and they talk about uh, killing the pig, you know, it's, it's a grade three class, and then taking the bladder and making it a balloon as a toy. Because that's what she wrote, that's what Laura Ingalls wrote. And then the teacher says, when well, one of the kids says, ugh, the teacher says, well, don't you love bacon? Oh. Knowing that, Rohan's in the class, right? Then there's some education. I mean, first thing that you want to do is just, just want to, you just want to do something. But instead, you write a letter, right? And and it, and it was great for me. Adrenaline fuel letter. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that you throw out, and then you write the second one. <laughs> um, where you kind of compare, you know, what did we do? We compared it to if there was a book where kittens and puppies were skinned and cut up, it yeah, might upset really. some of the other kids in the class. So if you could just think of it in that light. Plus, there could be Muslim kids, and I threw in all sorts of things. There could be Muslim kids in the class. There could be other people there where this would be a horrific thing. And, and very nice, and I'm sure you didn't mean to, and I'm sure, you know, this is a new idea for you. And, and Rowan didn't complain about in there, because he didn't. He just kind of came home and said, it was depressing. It was depressing for him. The actual story was depressing. And he, and he loves the book. You know, so, so, I mean, where I'm, going, where I'm going with that is I think um, 
I think there's more to it now, and, and maybe it's a really positive thing. That there's so many people raising vegan children, that there's so many toddlers who are vegan that, that wasn't before, and maybe that's a hopeful. So, what did the teacher say? The teacher saw Brian and immediately, like, he, he came up to you, didn't he? Yeah. Did he? Okay. I'm just, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. That was it? Yeah. And I mean, when he, he took Rowan aside oh. and said, and I think what he, what he basically got, I don't think he changed. I think a little flag went up that, oh, maybe I need to think, maybe I need to think these things through, right? But it's changed. Yeah, I mean, you know, it was, a, it, it, was, it was a lesson for him, but it was great. Look, we took, I took all the identifying information out, and so I'm like, that's a letter that, that you can pass on to, you know, that they're going to copy the letter. But for parents out there, when, you know, because, you know, it's hard for all of us, right? And, and everybody wants to write the first letter that I wrote. Can't we see that one? <laughs> 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 Go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that it just it just when you pointed out that most of uh, it, the information uh, that's out there about veganism is uh, directed at adults, and there should be more directed at children. Like that made me wonder why there isn't more directed at children because. Because the way I see it, it's I, I, I think that, that like children would more naturally want to be vegetarians or, or vegans because the, at that age they haven't been socialized to see animals as objects and, and relate to them as such and and like and I just like I think most children like like would be if they if they hadn't been socialized to see animals as certain animals as objects like like and like a child wouldn't notice like why that pig is different from uh, if it was uh, a kitten or, or a puppy having its throat slit and, and being put on a, on, a, on a stick. And, yeah, uh, and... I think it's the parents. You have to get parents on board before they yeah. let you... It's a barrier. The parents are a barrier. Yeah, but I, but I think like even if the parents are a barrier, I think that like children see animals as their yes. friends. Like like when, like I've always loved animals, and like when I was little, like I I always saw animals as as my friends, and like didn't understand like why you'd see an animal as different. And I had been I I had been raised to eat meat, like we ate meat all the time, and uh, yeah, and. Uh, and uh, it's, I think that, and I think that like if, I think that like when most children like find out like what actually happens to the animals that are turned into meat and like where meat really comes from, like they like kick and scream instead of eating that stuff. <laughs> Just say something about that at the sanctuary. We, uh, we, you know, we have a lot of kids that come up and they get to meet the animals. And we had one great experience of a boy who, who, as we were getting to know each other, said his favorite food was bacon. Mm -hmm. And we didn't say anything, but we went on to the next child, and we were just getting to know each other. But he fell in love with one of our pigs. Aww. And he said, came up to me and said, I will never eat another thing from a pig again. He made the connection because he was there, and he looked into the pig's eyes. He had interaction with That's why it's so important, I think, for them to get to know the animals as individuals. Yeah, and I think like I think like when we interact with animals like that, like a lot of us have been socialized to see as food. Like I think that really does it for people. Like even, like like even like when people like who have had like like pigs as as pets and like and like uh, chickens as pets and like they they like when they start like getting to know their pet as an an, an individual, like they they stop like wanting to wanting to eat that animal, they kind of make the connection. It's like, even if they have been raised to eat meat, they don't want to eat that anymore. There's a lot of all human rights philosophies, like, sort of based on individuals. Yeah. So, yeah. The same I think there's a couple people in the back who are, or, I had, sorry. I was, I was wondering about all of what you, you've been mentioning something like Arjuna, and you have to go to war if, if you're doing the right thing. Yeah, and somebody at the break said I shouldn't have used a military analogy, but I, I'm, just going to, I'm just going to say that, and I agree with that because I'm, you know, I'm against war and yeah, militarism. But, the other chief, it's confusing. But, but I'll just say that Gandhi's interpretation of that particular scripture 
was a non-violent interpretation. So he viewed war, he was using war in the way that I'm using it, not to refer to a real war, but to refer to uh, the spiritual battle that we're all engaged in, in this, in this, and that's how it's meant. That's exactly. That's meant exactly. So, uh, and he, he was very uh, definite about that interpretation because it has been misinterpreted in the past to, uh, to refer to war. Uh, to excuse, to justify war when it's actually could be used, it should be used as an argument for nonviolent, uh, nonviolence. And the point was to not be attached to the fruits of your labors, meaning um, don't don't think about the here in this context. Don't think about the billions um, and whether you can save them or not. Just do what you know to be right in the meantime. Yeah. I don't know if I answered that. It's <laughs> kind of a little bit confused. <laughs> well, it's like mixed no, metaphors. No, I mean, we, this is not a class on nonviolent uh, <laughs> philosophy. We'll do another one on that. But <laughs> okay. it's, uh, it's a deep issue. You got a question? Uh, yeah, it's about what you guys were saying about the socialization. There's actually a study that was done recently at the University of Chicago. Um, uh, it actually took rats. It, it was similar to the study uh, Paul mentioned last year, where they, they, they held rat, one rat was captive and held another rat, uh, saving it. Um, and what it, what's not interesting about that is, I mean, we all know that animals have it. But uh, what's interesting about it is that they they didn't have empathy for rats that they, the kinds of rats that they weren't raised and it, it just goes to show that all empathy comes from socialization as opposed to any rational argument. So, so the, what you guys are talking about. That, I, that I can agree with that. Because empathy is something you need to instill, I think, in somewhat. My son was brought up with a deep sense of empathy. And for um, through his teenage years, he always said to me, Mom, I don't see the point of you having taught me empathy. It's not doing me any good. <laughs> but now that he's 24, uh, he definitely sees the reasons for empathy and um, the influence that I've had on him as far as the connection to the earth and how we're all interconnected and how um, whatever decisions he makes in his life today can affect numerous people or life forms tomorrow. So um, empathy is, a, is definitely something that needs to be taught, and that is something that is lacking. We are in an apathetic world, unfortunately, and I think that is the biggest barrier that we face as any type of activist, is that apathetic viewpoint, in my opinion. This is always my opinion. I would say that's highly controversial. Like, so there might be one experiment that says that. There's a book called, Conrad Lawrence wrote a book called On Aggression. He came up with certain theories and findings. Um, so there's a lot of different theories of what human nature is and what's instinctual. You know, you can have one experiment that shows this, but experiments by design are very reductionist, not necessarily holistic. And um, so uh, I, you had an interesting thread where, uh, sort of, yeah, he was he was making the case that some it's, some of our instincts are to be compassionate and empathetic and things like that. So there are different you know there are different schools of thought on this issue because it's such a big issue to say what human nature is and what are our instincts. You know, it's a great conversation. I think we have to, we'll have to end now. <laughs>